Thank you very much, Pat. First of all, thank you all very much for coming out for this event. I think this is a very important event. Um, it's going to happen here and, and in Calgary. In fact, we have a number of events in Calgary with that one. Um, and I wanted to explain that our foundation is very interested in the whole concept of human rights here in Alberta and Canada because we feel that the time is ripe for a, a renewed conversation on human rights in, in Alberta. Given the events surrounding Section 11.1 in our Human Rights Act here in Alberta, and I won't get into that, other people will hear, I'm, I'm, so you'll learn about more, um, we really feel that we have to have a discussion about human rights so that we can possibly um, recommend a way forward to improve human rights here. Um, what we have now is, is not right and it needs to change. So we want to have that conversation now. We think that's a good, uh, it's a good time. Um, all of you know Delwyn. Um, Delwyn now is in Paris um, pursuing a, a web design career, I hear, um, and we are um, very happy to have him back here in Alberta. Um, as you know, um, Delwyn was fired from his um, job as a laboratory instructor at the King's College here in Edmonton in 1992 because of his sexual orientation. Thankfully for all of us, um, he had the courage to file a human rights complaint and a lawsuit against the government of Alberta for non-protection of his human rights based on his sexual orientation. And after three court hearings and nearly seven years uh, um, in court, Delwyn won his case. Um, and for any of you that are interested, there's clippings over there um, on the day that he won, and they're fascinating to look at. Um, that case clarified Canadian law. It certainly clarified law in uh, Alberta. And some say it has had international implications. It's a case that is taught in law schools across Canada now, um, and it's um, considered to be a very important case. Delwyn is an example that any one of us can make a difference, and a very big difference for some people. That's something very important for all of us, I think, to internalize. He's won n numerous awards and many kudos. When he's in Calgary, he'll be w um, receiving yet another award, the, the inaugural Alberta um, Hero Award. Um, and he's here for the 15th anniversary of, the, of his um, Supreme Court case. Um, so we are all much better off um, because of Delwyn's courage and because of his stamina. Um, and he is now a part of Alberta's history. So I have the great pleasure um, to introduce Delwyn Vreen, who is now an icon and a role model for all of us. Um, so it's with great pleasure and respect I introduce Delwyn to you. Hi, Delwyn. I think, I think the first time, I was thinking this afternoon, maybe the first time I met you, we were standing in the back of a pickup truck during a pride parade in the mid-90s, and it was pouring rain. <laughs> anyway. So you didn't like me. What's that? So you didn't like no, me. No, you were lovely. I just remember <laughs> going down White Avenue in this freaking pickup truck, and the, I think the parade was maybe Murray and Michael were probably there. Anyway, <laughs> and nobody else, because it was pouring rain. <clears throat> And, and we, we, we went past White Avenue, the Princess Theater, and there's this one guy with the God Hates Fags sandwich board on holding his finger up. And I just thought, oh, yeah, that's, that's why we're doing this. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Dylan, I, want to, I wanted to start by, by, having, by asking you to talk a little bit about those early days. You, you were hired by King's College in, in 19, 1988. Yeah. Was it around there? Yeah. And it was, so you were working, you were running chemistry labs? So yeah, I was, I was actually hired at the end of 1987, uh, December of 1987, but on a more, uh, more permanent basis, January of 88, uh, as a laboratory instructor for the, the introductory chemistry courses and a laboratory coordinator, uh, mm -hmm. coordinating the, um, the, the laboratories for, for biology, chem uh, physics labs as well. Okay. Now, 
I understand that in, in around, well, in 1990, sometime in 1990, the president of the college had occasion to ask you if you were gay. <laughs> could you tell, is that right? And could you tell me a little yeah, bit about how that happened? Well, we don't exactly know how that happened <laughs> because the president didn't actually tell us. But, um, yeah, the, uh, I was actually called into the, the president's uh, office along with the, the head of the chemistry department at the time. So the two of us went into the, uh, the president's office and um, the president said, well, it's come to my attention that um, you might be gay. Uh, and actually, he didn't use the word gay. I don't, I'm, I'm sure he did not use the word gay. He probably, uh, he probably didn't even use the word homosexual. I'm not even sure what he used, but it was, it was obvious that that's what he was talking about. And he said, well, I'm not here for any, um, any um, disciplinary action or anything. We're, we're not going to do anything. I just want to confirm whether or not you are, and uh, very awkward. I mean, he, he, was, he was very awkward in what he was saying, but just want to confirm that you are, you know, like gay. <laughs> like that. And um, my, my response was, uh, well, yeah, I, I, I am gay. I, that's, that's, that's a matter of fact. And uh, he was, well, okay, well, I understand you're more comfortable with men than with, than with women. And I said, whoa, <laughs> I am not more comfortable with you right now, so don't, don't, don't generalize this. Uh, I mean, I didn't say it that dramatically, but um, uh, that, was, that was a funny moment in my mind. And so that was it. Were you, did you have, like, really good hair or, you know, a nice sweater? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so, so he, just, he just pulled you aside and, and asked you, that, that and Just so you confirm. did. You did confirm that you were gay. Yeah. At, at that time, in in your personal life, were you were you an activist? Were you? Uh, what what does that what does that mean? Oh, activist. sorry. Were you were you doing the red pickup truck in the pride parade <laughs> thing back in nineteen? <laughs> okay, well. you already confirmed that. Yes, I guess I was an activist. In fact, I was. Um, a member of uh, Gala Gay and Lesbian Awareness of Edmonton Society. Um, uh, at the time, and uh, in fact, once this came out uh, at the King's College, I was in with the the group of us and said, "Hey, uh, this is going on. What what should I do?" And the uh, Michael, I'm looking at Michael Fair because uh, he was uh, he was an integral part of the group as well, and and uh, like, okay, well, first thing is to get a lawyer, and uh, found found me a lawyer and. Um, talked to the lawyer and, and basically was advised. At this point, you know, the King's College had, dis had said that, well, they were going to, going to talk about this. Uh, there, was nothing, there was nothing in the air. There was nothing set. There was no, no evidence that they were going to fire me at this point. Um, but around, around 1991 or 19, yeah, about 91, they, they passed a policy on homosexuality in the college. Was that kind of the next step of? Well, yeah, so af after a couple of years, uh, or it uh, wasn't quite a couple of years, after a year, um, they, the, the Board of Governors of the college had, had come up with some sort of policy. Now, they hadn't actually released this policy yet, um, but uh, in, in various meetings, continuous meetings between me and the President, uh, it, it was obvious that yeah, there was a policy being developed. Um, I was pretty sure that it was going to be something that, that basically would indicate that I could not be working at the King's College, but uh, that was not extremely clear. And that brought f forward a lot, of, a lot of the fears that I had of being fired. And of course, you know, talking with my parents and, and uh, they too are thinking, well, yeah, he's probably going to be fired and, and so on. And um, Gala was putting on a, a conference um, uh, on human rights as well, uh, for which um, we wanted some media attention. And uh, one of the stories that we thought would be good is a story where someone is afraid of or afraid for their job. So uh, the Edmonton Journal, um, Paula Simons, actually did uh, wrote an article um, and used my 
uh, me, uh, the King's College, uh, my parents, they, she interviewed my parents as well, um, about the fears of um, working in Alberta as, uh, as parents of a gay man, uh, as a gay man, and then with the college, uh, she interviewed the college as well. It was a little bit, a little bit of a tricky situation. Uh, it, we did not expect uh, our names to be used. We, the, the agreement originally with the reporter had been that um, names can be used if everyone agrees that names can be used. And uh, we didn't think that the King's College would agree to that, but in some way or form, Paula Simons uh, figured that the King's College had agreed to this. So our names were used, and um, it was it was quite an interesting uh, situation because there was the day of the uh, of the conference when this this uh, article came out in the Edmonton Journal, and I was at the conference. <laughs> I see this, and I'm thinking, I'm going to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! And uh, that was not comfortable going into work tomorrow. Well, of course, I just come in as if it's a normal day. And <clears throat> walk past the receptionist and the receptionist is like, Delwyn! <laughs> it's like, uh oh. <laughs> because of course she had had to field the calls all day and she was convinced that I had not come to work the day before simply to avoid all the calls. Not realizing that no, this, that had been planned months in advance and that the article just happened to come out. Um, so, um, that was when the shit really hit the fan uh, at the King's College, and it was it was it was a few months after that, a uh, few or several months after that, when really I got the 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 president of the King's College uh, asking me for my resignation, and finally on January 28th of uh, '92, um, was actually given a letter. Uh, a letter of resignation and asked to sign it and was told that if I did not sign it that my employment was terminated as of noon that day. Um, <laughs> for me that was a, <laughs> there was no choice. Like, okay, well, let's go out for a beer. I said, to <laughs> I mean, we, uh, my, um, the, uh, the head of the department at the time and I went to, uh, to the local bar on a Monday morning. Uh, had a beer, uh, came back at noon, I cleared out my office and went home. You know, it, at, at that point, you know, the, we, all, we all have crossroads, I guess, and this, you know, it sounds like it might have been one of them. I mean, it would have been quite a reasonable um, decision at that point to say, you know what, I think I'll just resign, I'll move on and, you know, move on with my career and not dig my, my heels in and, and make an issue of this. At that, it, it, and now I'm hearing a little bit more of the background. You did have some support at the time, but mm -hmm. when, d did you give any thought to that? You know what, I'll just find people who are a, a little bit more sane and I'll find a different job and these people can just sort of fester in their little antediluvian pool there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I told her I wouldn't use anything like that. <laughs> and anyway, you, you could have. <laughs> So, so, so there was a moment at which you could have just <laughs> you could have just moved on. But can you tell me mm. anything about your thinking there that you decided to? You know, make if a point? if anyone knows my dad, <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and um, a lot of the community that he grew up in, and of course my sister as well. She takes after all of us. That's just not the thing we did. Mm. Um, you don't just. You just you don't just sit down and take it. Um, <laughs> whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, no, it was this was unjust, and you. Uh, no, I couldn't let that sit. Hmm. You make it sound so easy. So <laughs> I'm, go I'm just going to ask you. A it wa it wa well, it wasn't easy, but the decision was easy. I, I get. And Thank you for making that decision. <laughs> You've changed a lot of lives with that decision. Um, you, you brought up your mom and dad and your sister. I didn't know your sister was here. Um, you brought up your mom and dad a couple of times. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, how and when they found out and, and what their reaction, you know, about how are things with your family back then? About me being gay or yeah. about the, me the being other fired? Yeah, the gay thing, not the fire <coughs> The thing. gay thing. Everybody the gets gay, fired, not everybody's gay. That gay thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
Does everyone get fired? Pretty much. Oh. <laughs> um, I had told them probably a year before. Uh, yeah, I had. Hmm. It's it's really hard to say. No, I I had I had told them about the same time that I started working at the King's College. Uh, And that went very well, extremely well. I was elated. They were the first persons, the people that I had told. Um, I had never told anyone else before because I was far too afraid that my parents would find out from someone else as opposed to me. So um, <coughs> I waited uh, until I could tell them. And um, actually, <laughs> I tried to tell them. It was actually my mom was like, after 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 a phone call of, well, can I talk to you sometime? It's like, oh no, forget it, no. And, and then pushing on with the conversation, and finally my mom is saying, so are you gay? <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was um, it was about the same time that I that I I started working at the King's College. And that went very well. And uh, with my brothers and sisters, too, very, very well. It's uh, very supportive. Mm -hmm. And they were extremely supportive through, um, through all of the, the process the after I was fired as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the day that I was fired, I believe I, I, believe I drove down to their place and um, basically told them in person, <laughs> would drive to the farm and, hi, Mom, hi, Dad. Why aren't you at work? Because I was fired. <laughs> mm. I, I imagine a lot of people in the, in the audience have as I have, just enjoyed that beautiful, steady presence at the farmer's market that just says Vreens <laughs> on the top. And those of us who are even a little acquainted with Vreens, it's, you know, you can go and get potatoes and beets and stuff, but, it's, but it's a, it, there's just a beautiful, solid, loving place where I know that queer people and queer youth went and felt safe and you're blessed with such beautiful parents. And so that's been a presence in this community and we're thankful for it too. Well, I know that my parents have, or my mom especially has said that people have come up to them and, and said, can you be my parents? I, I think that <laughs> might have, I think, no, no, that wasn't me, but it could have been. <laughs> yeah. so, so you went, um, you, you talked about lawyers getting involved and one of the questions, um, Anyone out there who's about to rush the Bastille and take a matter to the Supreme Court of Canada might think it's going to cost some money. So you talked about lawyers being involved pretty early on. Yeah. How, d how did the money thing work? Like there's, it, there's, it's not just lawyers' fees. I mean, if they're going to work for free, well, there's great. There's a lot of, you know, it there's a, it's, takes a lot of money to grind things through the court. So what can you tell me about, about that side of things? Well, the first court case um, was done with uh, a lawyer, Victor, um, uh, was his name, and we we did a lot of fundraising for it, um, you know. And, and the, my initial consultation with him, of course, was free, uh, as is normal with with lawyers. But uh, then after that, consultation just cost money. And then when we went to court, yeah, this cost this cost quite a bit of money, and we did a lot of fundraising. Um, I don't remember offhand exactly what sort of fundraising we did, um, but there was a lot that was going on, and and. Um, we, you know, by the end of that court case, we still hadn't paid him off completely. It, it still took a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. um, it was when we went to the second and third level, he, because he, did, he moved away to Ottawa, so I w basically could no longer really use him. Um, Sheila Greckel and her crack team of, of associates and, and, um, uh, and others, uh, you included, of course, um, uh, stepped forward and basically offered to take this case on pro bono. Um, but yes, even then, there are still a lot of costs. There are filing costs. There are, I mean, costs here, there, and everywhere. It's not just the, it's just not, not just the lawyer who is, is costing you money. And um, I was actually talking to Murray a little bit about that, and, and he knows a little bit more about what sort of fundraising went on, but um, for that even, I'm not even sure we, we paid off the final bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving, moving right along. <laughs> um, this, the, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to 
to ask you and have you talk a little bit about the reality of this legal struggle. I mean, you, the, the injustice happened in 1991. You go to the Human Rights Commission and they say, no, sexual orientation isn't here. Are you sure you're not Jewish? We could help you. Yeah. If you're Jewish, we could help. Yeah. You know, that, um, and so, but, but then the journey started. I mean, the Court of Queen's Bench decision was, was 1994. The Court of Appeal in 1996 and the Supreme Court not till 1998. That's an awfully long time. Can you tell me a little bit about how you, your emotions were? Did you get, did you find yourself getting, was there a point at which you just sort of got discouraged and said, the hell with this, I'm, I don't want to do this anymore? Like, what was that like? I mean, that's a hell of a long time to be a poster child for anything. Mm. Poster child. I hope I wasn't a child. Oh, sorry. <laughs> poster, post, cute poster, poster person. Poster boy was bad enough. That's what everyone kept referring to me as, and, and it's not a really a term that I liked. But, um, but in many ways, that's, that's what my role in the whole thing was. The, the lawyers took care of most things. I was the face in the media. Um, right from the beginning, um, my partner at the, at the time, at the very beginning, already he, uh, Nick, um, would field a lot of the phone calls that would come in just because I just, I, I, I couldn't deal with it. It's like, I really, I can't answer this call. Can you answer it? And, you know, if it's someone that's looking for an interview, tell them he's out or whatever. It's just like, you'll have to phone back later. Um, and that was sort of the way things were through the entire seven years. Um, there, were t were, there were times when, okay, I c think I can deal with a little bit of media. And there were times when, oh, I just, I just couldn't and would just not respond to that phone. Uh, in fact, to this, to this very day, the ring of a telephone causes me intense anxiety. I, just, I, I often still do not answer a phone just because it has always caused so much anxiety. Um, there was that side of things and then, then the side of actually being at things like this um, with media um, in, in, you know, the public, uh, with direct contact to the public. Um, and although I could do it, it would always cause me a lot of stress, um, especially right beforehand. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm, Unfortunately, I'm someone who gets a migraine when they start to stress out, so I would get a lot of migraines. Um, uh, but somehow you just, you just get through it. And, and it sounds like you, ha you had some support at that time that, that sort of gave oh you yeah, your partner well at the time and your parents. And, and Murray was and one Murray. of my protectors. Um, he's like, nope, stay away from him. <laughs> 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 off, off limits for the time. Um, mm. When no. in on the, uh, you know, the, the day that will be forever blazed in my brain is that day in the Supreme Court of Canada, November 4th, 1997. There was, yeah. there was a bunch of people there that were, there were uh, and the reason I was there, you mentioned me as being involved, and I, and I wasn't. I was, uh, just, just to give you a sense of my, my involvement in this, okay, there were 17 interveners. I was one of three lawyers for one of them. Ta-da. Okay, so... Um, but I was lucky enough to be able to be in that room. Can you just take a few mo moments to talk about what that felt like when you were in there listening to your counsel and counsel for all? Interveners are groups that ask to come forward and give a particular point of view that will help the court making its decision. There were churches, there was the Canadian Human Rights Commissions, there were um, the Canadian Labour Congress, all, all sorts of interveners were involved. So it was a, it was a big show. Anyway, what, what, are your, what are your big top memories out of that day? Well, uh, yeah, one of the top memories was seeing all nine judges walk in and realizing that, wow, we've got, uh, we've got such an important case that we get, we get all the judges, not just a fraction of them, but really all of them. Um, you know, when, when we talk about me being in these courtrooms, I was not ever part of the, the, the legal team. I was never, I, I never gave testimony. I never uh, provided depositions even. Um, I was in the audience. Um, 
so I was watching this like a lot of other people were in the audience. And um, in the, I mean, the, the room was full. It was packed. We, had, we, were, we were lucky to, to, to get a place to actually sit and watch uh, the proceedings. And then um, uh, we had expected the, the case to be argued over a period of two days, or we, we were, two days was allocated. Um, in the morning, we started with, uh, with our side, I believe. Is that correct, John? Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, not, not a whole lot of, of unexpected uh, happenings there. It was, uh, it was fascinating to see the, the, the nine judges and, and their reactions uh, and their, their, their questions. They, they seem to be fairly intelligent questions. Um, what was very interesting was coming back in the afternoon and having the interveners um, Which it could be, uh, so interveners could be on the same side or, or countering, uh, providing counter arguments, saying, "Hey, no, you, this this should not be." Um, uh, well, they should not win. We'll leave it at that. Um, and one <laughs> one thing that that sticks in my mind is one of the religious groups lawyers trying his hardest. And you could tell that his heart really wasn't in it, but he was trying his hardest to give the arguments of his, his religious group. And the judge would constantly ask questions, and his questions were so pointed, they would point out how ridiculous this, these arguments were, and the courtroom would, would burst out in laughter whenever this judge was, was asking these questions, and uh, you, just, it, you just thought, oh, if seeing, seeing the judges do that, especially that one judge, and how things had gone, it's like, uh, what, a, what a wonderful feeling. Mm -hmm. we, I, uh, I think we all had a pretty good feeling after that. Um, and then um, there was the Canadian Jewish Congress, and the lawyer for the C uh, Canadian Jewish Congress was, um, was, sorry? Live, Live yeah. And he, um, he basically came to the courtroom to say, look, people were, were silent when, when uh, the Germans started to act against us. We cannot remain silent when uh, our brothers and sisters are being persecuted. Did you cry? I cried. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was. I think everyone in, <laughs> in yeah, <laughs> pull out the tissue paper. Yeah, that was. That one, where where time disappears. I don't know. It's some kind of thing. What um. This has been, you know, it's been a long time. I mean, it's been 19, 1988, 1990, 1991. I mean, you you, you took you, you picked one of the one of the paths and you followed it. You know, you could have just walked away from this business and it sort of, and you didn't. And so looking back on it now, do you think it had an effect on your life? Like, do you think <laughs> it, it's made you a better person, a worse person? Like, what, 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 have you, what have you gained from this experience that you might be able to share with us? Because we haven't walked that path. We watched. We didn't walk it. What have I gained? You know, what I d one thing that I do with this this is this is a little bit uh, paralleling what you just what you just asked, um, but for every bad thing that has happened to me in my life, and especially this one, this bad thing of being fired, I would say so much good has come and has come from it. Um, you know this <laughs> this firing. Um, bef before I was fired, I was out to a few people. I was out to my parents, I was out to a few friends. Um, but not that many people. Well, the day that I was fired, I was out to the world. And there was no going back in the closet. And w it, it has been a, a wonderfully freeing thing, I think. I know of so many people who still 
are out to a lot of people, but you know, there's always someone that they're not out to. And for me, it's just, <laughs> this is who I am. <laughs> Uh, there, there's, there's never even a question of do I tell or do I not? Do I, do I hold my tongue or do I not? It just that was such a freeing thing, and I think that was a very big positive. Well, I have to wrap it up now, but do you have a bit of advice? I mean, there, there are people <laughs> out there. I know. I, I said almost. Stay in school. Up. Don't <laughs> drink. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. You see, what we don't tell the next little hero that's sort of waltzing around, you know, about standing at that forking path and wondering which way am I going to go, do you have any advice, you know, other than, care, you know, get a lot of sleep and drink water, you know? <laughs> yeah, do you have any, any thoughts that, that might help the next person who's wondering, geez, I wonder if I really, you know, after hearing this guy's story, do I have, do I have what it takes? Do you have any advice? Well, you know, yeah, I do, actually, uh, because the stories don't have to go the way mine did either. I, in many ways, even though it was something that I did not like, I chose to remain present in the media. I, remain, I, I chose to, to be very visible in this, even though in many ways I did not like it. You do not have to choose to do that. You, you can go to the Human Rights Commission, you can file a complaint, you can do this and remain basically anonymous. Um, and I think it's very important that if, if something does happen, that people do um, take, take the responsibility and, 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 and follow through on, on it in some ways. Go to the Human Rights Commission, see what they say. Uh, you know, if, if they say that you may have a case here, file a complaint. Um, you know, do it. You don't have, it, it doesn't have to be what mine was. If, if that's what's scaring people off, it shouldn't. Delwyn, thank you so much. You've made a bigger difference than I, I, uh, than I expect you imagine. And thanks mom and dad and sister. <laughs>